Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to our um, second COVID-19 webinar, Working Together to Support Clubs. Um, my name is Tom, I'm the Participation Strategy Manager at Big Sport. Um, I'll take things slow for a moment just to let everyone to ease in and, and join the, uh, the webinar. Um, welcome. Now, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners um, of the land upon which we all meet today and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, just in terms of brief housekeeping for this webinar, um, we should be displaying slides for the whole time. So you should be able to see slides and then um, just a small box with whoever's speaking as we work through. Um, you'll have a, a chat function and also a Q&A function. So um, in terms of questions for the Q&A later on, if you can put questions into the um, Q&A box, we can have a look at those later on. Uh, we may not get to them all, but we'll try and answer as many as we can and any that we don't, um, we can try and get back to you by email following the webinar. Um, and there's also a chat function. So if you want to ask us a question, don't put it in the chat, put it in the Q&A, but you're welcome to use the chat for um, any other comments or discussion within the group. All right, let me click through. So just about Big Sport. Uh, Big Sport is the peak body for sport in Victoria. Uh, we represent and advocate on behalf of an estimated 3.25 million participants in sport and recreation, um, approximately 580,000 volunteers, 100 sport associations, and an estimated 16,000 clubs, providing one voice to government and industry. Um, Big Sport develops programs and policies, and we work with our state sport association, regional sports assembly, local government, peak sport organisation members to deliver participation opportunities for all Victorians for better health, well-being, and enjoyment. And we work very closely with our government partners, um, Sport and Recreation Victoria from the state government, and of course Vic Health. So the agenda for today, um, this webinar is all about working with clubs. Um, so we're going to look at uh, what clubs are telling us, how we can help clubs to rebuild stronger and more inclusive, and look at some of the ongoing impacts of the COVID-19 environment um, on community sport. Uh, we've got a range of speakers with excellent and diverse experience across the sports sector, um, including Karen Pierce from Football Victoria, Melanie Pratt from Cardinia Shire Council, Michael King from Leisure Networks, and Sharon Milner from the Victorian Responsible Gambling Foundation. Um, now, one thing I want to mention is you might have seen that there were some national principles for returning to sport released last week by the federal government. So um, just in case there are any questions people are planning and asking about those principles today, um, they're not necessarily in effect in Victoria yet. They might require some editing into the Victorian context. Um, and with the current state of emergency lasting until the 11th of May, um, we'd expect an announcement, you know, potentially around that date, around what that return to sport looks like in Victoria. So we don't have any more answers today beyond what you would have seen out there in the media and from the Australian Institute of Sport. Um, but that's something that we're definitely all working towards over the next week in uh, looking at how, that, how that's going to look. Um, Big Sport is also developing a checklist for sport and clubs to work through upon the return to sport, um, just to help people to consider all of the different um, you know, things a club might, might need to look at when getting back into sport participation. Um, I'm going to run through now quickly what some of those considerations are, um, but not in an exhaustible way. We'll certainly have the checklist ready quite soon for people to flick through and, um, and use um, as desired. So what some of the considerations are, and look, there are a lot. And um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, there's an estimated 16,000 clubs in Victoria. Uh, they're not a homogenous group. They're all different. They all have their different needs and challenges and the way they need to be supported is always going to vary. Um, but to cover off as briefly as I can on the range of considerations facing sport clubs during this time. From a strategic planning perspective, um, it could be a good chance to do a, a general strategic review, looking at things like mission and purpose and um, what your club aims to achieve in a strategic sense. 
Um, it could be looking at any potential season changes, the return dates, and making sure you've got a strategic plan and approach to getting back into sport. Um, looking at member attraction and retention and whether there need to be any changes to membership models or flexible payment options that can um, try and encourage people back and also keep them following this time. Um, and finally, with sponsorship, potentially looking at um, any risks around sponsors not coming back and having a, a strong strategic approach to maintaining those relationships into the future. From a financial planning perspective, um, looking at budget planning, um, considering cash flow forecasts and applying for the various funding and grants such as JobKeeper that are on offer to support sport organisations. Um, from a compliance perspective, there could be considerations around running AGMs and, and making sure that um, the required rules are followed, especially if they're done remotely. Um, looking at things like responsible servicing of alcohol and liquor licensing and whether there needs to be um, you know, any updating of certificates or um, anything in that space. Similarly, with child safe standards and working with children checks, it could be a good time to review compliance with the various um, Victorian laws relating to um, child safeguarding and considering the return to sport and how the club is going to comply with um, whatever the requirements are. From a stakeholder perspective, um, really about relationships. So members, volunteers, um, relevant peak state body or local regional sports assembly, local councils, funders, sponsors, maintaining relationships with these groups and building relationships where we can uh, for the betterment of the club. From a health and safety perspective, um, we don't know what this looks like, but there could be a lot of new things to consider when sport is back, but when the COVID-19 threat is still very much real. Um, that could include just planning for how social distancing measures can be put in place in the club, um, what happens if there is a local outbreak that requires some changes, um, and what other risk things might need to be put in place to protect people's safety um, during that time. And also looking at mental health and how we can support people uh, within the club um, during what's a tough time for a lot of people. Um, risk management, so making sure you've got the appropriate insurance in place, working with state and national bodies on that if any changes need to be made in the future, uh, reviewing risk plans and risk registers, um, putting a plan around business continuity if that's, if that's been a challenge for clubs. From a human resource perspective, if, um, where there's paid staff members considering what that return to work phase looks like and how we can re-engage volunteers. From a facility perspective, um, looking at the availability of facilities and I guess with COVID-19 potentially creating some um, you know, changes to, to seasons and a potential issue around the change from winter to summer sport, just making sure there's a clear plan in place and understanding around that, working with other sports and working with the local council. Um, and potentially it's a time to start some facility funding planning because um, those processes can take uh, a few years sometimes at the best of times. And finally, there's the consideration around innovation and doing sport differently, um, looking at how we can potentially attract new people down to sport clubs, um, continuing to develop welcoming and inclusive cultures as much as possible, and looking at the use of modified formats. Um, I also just wanted to touch on a few statistics. Um, so you might have seen that Sport Australia last week released um, some new data as part of their Ausplay survey. And there was one particular graphic they've put out which has some trends from 2001 to 2019. Um, it's, it's not a huge surprise, but I just thought it was um, interesting to reflect on what some of the data was showing. So um, participation in sport related activities only has decreased from 32% in 2001 to 19% um, in the current time, or last year. Um, whereas participation in both sport and non-sport related activities has gone up from 25% to 40%. Um, and on top of that figure is people who just participate in, in non-sporting, so more recreational things. So I think to me that just emphasises again um, how important it is for clubs to consider that what they're offering is very much complementary to a lifestyle that is going to include active recreation and things like walking or going to the gym or doing yoga um, or, or even swimming, you know, those activities that are really, really popular in Australia. Um, how clubs can not so much try to uh, wrestle people away from those activities, but be something that people can do um, both during a given week um, is a really important consideration moving forward. 
And there was some stats coming out from Gemba last week suggesting that 44% of people have been less active during COVID-19. Um, so I think the impact on participation definitely hasn't been great. Now, some ongoing questions. These are not questions I'm expecting our panelists to necessarily answer right now. Um, just questions that I think all of us are looking at that everyone tuning in today um, hopefully can continue to consider within your um, sports and different contexts. Um, how can we retain the existing members that we already had in sport? How might we attract new participants? Um, how can we be more welcoming and inclusive of our local community? Um, how can we better support and celebrate volunteers? That's almost more a question for people at peak bodies, but certainly within clubs as well. Um, how can we promote health equity and social cohesion through clubs? And how can involvement at a sport club complement other fitness activities? So um, there is a lot for all of us to consider on an ongoing basis. Um, I don't think we need to have all the answers right away because um, I've been saying during this time, I think we needed innovation before. We certainly need it now, and we're going to need an innovative approach to community sport um, for many years after this current time. Okay, um, I'm going to throw to the first panelist now. It certainly is weird again talking to over 400 people um, without being able to see anybody, and I'm sure our panelists are going to do an excellent job this morning. So. Our first speaker is from Football Victoria, um, Karen Pierce, who's the Executive Manager of Growth and Inclusion and was also the 2018 Victorian Sports Administrator of the Year. Um, many of you know Karen for her long stint at Basketball Victoria as well, running participation and inclusion programs. Um, and before we jump into the speakers, what we're asking from each one is just a five minute update around what they're hearing, what the challenges are from their perspective um, and sort of, I guess, their comments on how we continue to work together to support clubs. So Karen, if you're there, we'll unmute your mic and video and throw to you for your five minute update. Thanks, Tom. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to those past, present and emerging. Um, hello to uh, a huge range of people that I have seen that are on um, here at the moment that I do know. Hello to you. And um, thank you and welcome to those that I don't, haven't met yet and um, lovely to e-meet you. Um, so from Football Victoria perspective, how do we keep our clubs engaged through this time? We enacted a work from home precautionary measure back on the 23rd of March for Football Victoria. Um, helped set people up at home with uh, workspaces and, and we're hoping that it would still be a bit of business as usual. But as we know, with uh, COVID, it, it hit pretty um, quickly and, and things were moving quite rapidly in the sporting space. So unfortunately, we had to make the decision on the 1st of April to stand down about half of our staff and retain a core skeleton staff of people to try to keep the business moving. Part of that skeleton staff was our club ambassadors who work right across the um, uh, Victorian landscape with football with our 355 clubs so the main perspective on their behalf was to keep that connection going with our clubs. We knew that our clubs were looking for guidance, they wanted reassurance, um, they wanted reliable advice and uh, we had our club ambassadors um, begin straight away on that 23rd of March to start uh, making contact with our clubs and we documented all of that evidence. And by the 31st of March, so prior to um, the skeleton staff stand down, they had reached about 79% of our, our clubs and we were getting some really good information. A lot of that was direct phone call. Um, some of the clubs had closed the doors. Others were remaining open and, and trying to see what they could do in the hope that football would come back uh, a lot quicker. So we kept the contact up with them. We, we listened to what they were saying. We produced fact sheets, um, surveys that went out. The um, competitions team that were left with three people working were um, constantly looking and still are on scenario planning to help the clubs finding out what, what they needed, how, how, do, how does a season start, when does it start, what does it begin to look like, 
um, what can we get it through? Uh, and obviously it, it probably won't look much like what it should have been. We were on track at that time to have a record number of, of teams in football um, this year. So there is an impact across the whole landscape. Um, we had guidelines, we did social media, there were online um, football skills and drills that the kids could do and we were communicating um, from local to state and up as far as federal government. So we kept our clubs informed of all of that and, um, and continue to do so with them. So some of the challenges, we know that generally most of our clubs were valuing the health and safety of their people first and foremost. But on top of that was what is football going to look like? Look like? It has been devastating to many of them. The Gippsland clubs, um, not just football, but everybody up there with that double whammy of the bushfires from you know, late, late last year and, and how do they actually resurrect themselves coming back into sport the big question, of course, is when is football back? And we can't give them that answer. You know, we're, we are all reliant on government to tell us that. So um, that, that is all part of the scenario planning that we're undertaking to, to put a date on here we are. They're also asking for a bit of leeway. You know, a lot of kids not training, obviously, unless they're doing some kick to kick in the backyard, but uh, they need at least a three, maybe four week window to get their teams back and to get some level of fitness up so they can resume football competition. Refunds are a major challenge um, and fee reduction, what does that look like? And unfortunately, we haven't been able to specify what refunds look like at the moment because we're still working through that. They're fearful of their lack of volunteers, even not just those around the club, but from a committee perspective, particularly those clubs that did lock the doors. Um, and the impact financially on families, um, volunteers that have walked away, are they going to come back? Does that community hub still look like it used to? Facility access for us as a winter sport, what does that look like um, beyond the time that we usually have? As some, of our, some of our clubs have access pretty much sometimes all through the year and sometimes into the summer season, but most of them stop September, October. So we're working through that uh, with the uh, sport and recreation um, work group that they've got that includes the, um, the councils, the winter sports, uh, Vic Sport, uh, and obviously ourselves. Sponsors, um, Tom, you mentioned that before. Some of them have moved away, particularly those small businesses that have been impacted. There's not that spare dollar anymore. So how do they retain that? The, the extra... Um, hit on the clubs were how they use sponsorship money, for example, to purchase kits. And some of those kits are in, um, I, I saw one that was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, but we can talk about tens of thousands of dollars. So if that money has gone, how do they actually pay, pay for that now if sponsors don't come back? The player commitment is a huge challenge. Those that committed at the start of the season with family impact on COVID, will they come back? this season? Will they wait for next season? Will they not come back at all? We don't, these are questions we don't know. And that financial viability that they once had with social restrictions, even when sport comes back, where they're actually not getting a gate um, taking or limited uh, canteen takings and, and social membership because of social restrictions and what they might look like. So they will have a, an absolute financial hit there. However, um, there are opportunities and we know that. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. We're seeing it apart from the um, unfortunate um, news that we heard yesterday of another 22 people in Victoria. Um, impacts us a little bit more down here, but some along the way have been looking at strategic planning. I actually was working with one of our associations yesterday on dates to do some strategy work with them. I've um, presented my women and girls strategy twice um, in the last probably three weeks. So people are starting to think about things that they can do. Uh, facilities, we've got a lot of work going on in there still. Um, thank, thank you to all those uh, councils that are out there. So that's been fantastic to be able to keep planning our facilities and our national uh, club development program, which is all around governance, um, female participation, welfare, volunteers, all of that. We've got a number of our clubs still regularly 
I think it's a, it's a star accreditation um, system and we would have around about two new clubs getting an, um, going up the chain in the NCDP every week. Uh, we've begun work on a Football Victoria resource library, so we've got um, things that we can help our clubs with when this lifts. And then what does football look like? If it's not just coming back wham bam into competition, which in some cases it won't be, how do we actually plan and work with our clubs on uh, social activations and engaging other um, people that wouldn't necessarily engage in football? I've probably done my five minutes, Tom, so um, that's football's perspective at the moment. So thank you. Excellent. Thanks for that, Karen. Um, sounds like you've been very, very, very busy. Um, and obviously there is certainly a, yeah, a pretty, a pretty bad impact on a lot of clubs. Um, but as I said, light at the end of the tunnel and um, plenty of work to do to help the clubs to, uh, to get back into playing some football this year. Yeah. All right. Let me click on to next. We have Mel Pratt from the Cardinia. Chai Council. Uh, many of you probably know Mel as well. She's been um, Sport Development Sport Council for many years at Cardinia and also City of Casey and is very much a guru of um, local government sport club developments. So over to you, Mel. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, and thanks for the introduction. I think talking me up a, a little bit too much that I hope I don't disappoint the audience. Um, thank you for having me on board. I just wanted to precursor this that Obviously, there's 79 Victorian local governments and, and Kadinia is one in the, the southeast corridor and obviously with varying populations across local governments. Uh, I'm going to focus a little bit today on some of the, the words around local government uh, and also wanted to mention that most local governments, or there are quite a few number of local governments getting together weekly through Zoom chats, um, rec people are hosting a weekly Zoom chat where we're actually um, collaborating a little bit more and getting examples from each other uh, and, and what challenges each of us are facing. So I'm actually going to not just leverage off what Kadinia are doing at the moment, but what some of the other councils are also doing. So obviously when, when COVID uh, hit, the main um, I guess response from local government in the first instance was around the traditional side of what local government do and that was around our facilities. So ensuring that facilities were, were safe, sending out the communication to uh, our sporting clubs and what that actually looks like and um, restrictions. So following the guidelines obvious, obviously of the, the federal government uh, restrictions and as they continue to change um, about you know whether they could participate in small groups or larger groups and access to pavilions. So the initial correspondence with clubs um, for majority of councils was about facilities and and how how that would be impacted. Um, from then, I guess a lot of councils looked at uh, similarly to what Karen has mentioned, but putting it out to all our sporting clubs around how they actually are, what's the wellness factor, what are some of the challenges um, initially that they're facing. So councils were, were quite concerned about um, whole of community perspective and, and where in a, I guess, the hierarchy of needs sport fit into that. So obviously, as most people are aware, council are made up of a whole lot of different work groups and some targeting uh, different cohorts across communities. So the initial response was around what is our wellness? Where are our factors? You know, are people receiving meals? Where's the vulnerability in community? And that extended to sporting clubs. Obviously, we know sporting clubs are hubs for um, social communication, connection, engagement, participation. So initial wellness ratings in different in different in different ways some actually uh, some councils sent out a survey uh, others have done it through phone calls and starting to call sporting clubs as well so initially also the feedback and the concern from most sporting clubs is similar to what Karen said it was around financial vulnerability how are we going to pay our fees how are we going to pay council for facility usage uh, and will our volunteers return and will our members return? Uh, in response to that, a number of councils are quite quick to react and looked at their fees and charges for 
um, grounds and maintenance and um, to the clubs and what they actually charge. Uh, kidding you, we don't charge a whole lot to our sporting clubs and some of our sporting clubs don't actually pay either. Uh, we have a little bit of a, a different model as a Section 86 model. So um, that challenge also means that kidding you that we uh, don't have contact initially with all our sporting clubs because we don't allocate all our facilities. So that threw in a little bit of a spanner of how to actually look at the wellness and uh, factors of our sporting clubs. So as I mentioned, financial vul vulnerability. So the initial response is around uh, support packages to clubs. That's been included in a number of councils uh, in a whole of council support package, whether it fits in a, a business element or a sporting club element. So most councils will have responded through a budgeting process to look at that. Um, Darabin was one of the first councils to actually put that into practice and, and come up with a figure as well. Um, the next stage was a little bit around uh, still the wellness, but digging a little bit deeper into the clubs and putting out a, a bit of a checklist. And I know, Tom, you mentioned Vic Sport will also be, be working on this, which will be handy. Uh, one of the, the resources that has been put out is Manningham Council actually did a really uh, positive a document that they sent out to clubs. Now it was was aiming a little bit of a checklist, like have you turned off your fridges? Have you considered your sponsors? What are some of the positive things you can do? Make sure you're checking in with your members. So real basic level um, working through that process as well. Now Manningham have shared that with a number of other councils. So I'm sure they'll be happy to share that, uh, continually share that with local government other local governments as well. It was highlighted that the document wasn't an essential, you have to do this. It was just highlighted around what are some of the steps you can take for your club. Now that did include um, some positive actions um, because we know some clubs will be have that time to develop strategically, look at their policies and processes with lots of links and, you know, shout out to Michael. Well, I know he's next up, but lots of links to club help and play by the rules and, and those things that are available to clubs as well. Um, like I said, initially it's financial vulnerability and um, now it's moving into a, a little bit about strategic development and the proactive side of things. Again, we're very conscious of our wellness of our clubs and what the feelings may be around uh, anxiety, getting back to play, you know, it's not just switching on a button and everything returns to normal. So that will be an ongoing relationship. Um, one of our cricket leagues have, you know, obviously cricket season ended a little bit abruptly. So a lot of the cricket clubs were quite disappointed. And in that fact, um, the association was already planning strategic development, but they've stopped, paused and actually done welfare calls to all their clubs just to see where the pinch points are. Do they think they can have a digital AGM? If not, you know, how to support them through that process as well. So we're actually, you know, six, five, six weeks in moving into the proactivity space um, and looking at some of the doing sport differently, looking at some of the activations, the things that are happening or aren't happening or, um, you know, I know Tom, you mentioned that the participation is down, but there's also people out in the streets doing things a little bit differently. So how do we capture that post COVID? And are they the people that are doing it because it's a, something to do to get out of the house, to be physically active? Or are they people that are a little bit lost without their sporting club? So that's really important. Um, again, there's some some really positive cross council collaborations that have come out of this, not saying council don't collaborate internally, but some of the really great initiatives is Dandenong is actually um, using their sporting clubs to host uh, active things and how to stay active and posting that through their youth department and through their Facebook pages. So giving the sporting clubs a little bit of exposure, keeping them engaged as well. Um, Frankston Council have actually linked with their economic development department and are creating a bit of a, a business sport link uh, as well. So linking up those sporting clubs with uh, businesses, both for a little bit of a camaraderie, but also uh, mentorship 
in relation to a business might have some skills to offer a sporting club or encourage them, encouraging them how to look at a marketing plan or a strategic plan as well. Um, Kidinia specific, we've got a connecting Kidinia page and residents are posting things around um, the things that are happening on Facebook, the rainbow trails, the Anzac trails uh, and those type of things as well. But we're localising it and bringing it back to Kidinia. Um, again, uh, Kidinia will leverage off our Monash Health Partnership through our healthy sports clubs and uh, as well as Casey and Dandenong and use that as a platform to support our clubs through different different areas so and one one of the final things I know there's a lot of questions around anxiety and returning to sport and what that may do to local level communities uh, Kidding is working with Richmond Football Club and uh, Risel in looking at mental health first aid and and that was something that we were doing pre-COVID and as soon as it hit we had to look at what is the appropriate timing and sensitivities of community as well um, so using some of the things that people are already doing out there as well is looking at placemaking and where placemaking fits and how to engage communities back into making and helping them look at their communities uh, and what are the important needs when you sort of look at hierarchy of needs that falls back into obviously sporting clubs so the hubs is it hubs of activities is it um actually doing sport differently in someone's court so is it proactively taking participation to um, to the people rather than taking them back to a, a sporting venue as well so there are I guess lots of challenges uh, as everyone has mentioned but the other thing that's really important and the the biggest challenge that we're obviously facing is as Karen mentioned we know a lot of our state bodies um, have reduced staff or reduced time in staff and and what that actually means in uh, local level delivery and when sport does pick up how council actually support those local perspectives um, knowing the resourcing from a state state different state bodies will be at different level so the challenges is really around that communication um, what the clubs are hearing who they're getting the information from as well as is council and council officers also getting that information so we're we're on the same page to deliver um, the the right or or solutions together so in collaboration so with the number of staff I guess from varying state bodies it, it's looking at what the databases exist at the state bodies to who is receiving the information. So from my perspective, there's lots of research going on, lots of looking at different websites, the Vic Sport website, the AIS website, um, or Sport Australia website, different uh, state body websites as well. So in, in saying that my, that my final takeaway is that local government are really um, aware of the facility uh, challenges that may come up with season changes and um, the impact that has on participation in regards to winter and summer season changeover and transfer and getting facilities ready but also around community wellness and well-being um, and what rating and what scale that looks like for sport and participation and and how participation supports mental well-being as well um, communicating so uh, what are the messages coming across? As I just mentioned, what are some of the changes and challenges and, and how we get through that? And also be proactive and thinking differently. So, you know, for want of a better term is, is doing that pivot and having those switches that also enable us to look at the whole of community with a whole lot of lenses as well around inclusion, participation, and not just doing things because that's how it's always been done. So taking an opportunity and being proactive in that space and allowing um, that to also occur and getting back to, to grassroots and talking to our community about what they want and need. So rather than we think this is a great idea. So again, it's the, the increase of partnerships, collaboration, um, and that's, that's wholly important. And I'm sure everyone, both on the panel and all the people um, that are engaged today will agree. So they're just a few things. Um, we know that there'll be a proactive phase. Um, each club will be at a different level, but it's how we 
we make that personalized in some sense and utilize some of the resources, the workshops, the engagement tools that are happening as well. So that's in a, in a nutshell, all the challenges that we're looking at, but also um, the, the exciting space of being able to plan differently. Um, I know you said it, Tom, it is, you know, taking this innovation and challenge and doing sport differently. So um, that's where we all fit in that space as well. And again, the collaboration out of everything is probably the key highlight, the, the fact that there is a number, number of local governments actually coming together and, and weekly talking about challenges and finding solutions and actions together has been a really, really positive thing across the industry. Awesome. Thanks for that, Mel. That's an excellent summary of all the considerations from a, a local government perspective. Um, I think you're definitely right that communication and collaboration um, are just extremely important at this time. And when it comes to working with clubs, just speaking to them directly and, and understanding where they're at and what they're hoping to achieve. Um, the innovation stuff's interesting. I think that a lot of the stuff that's happening at, at home in terms of virtual workouts and activities that um, different sports and councils are putting out is really coming back to the idea of just people having fun and and almost just replicating games you'd play as a kid in primary school. Um, how can we bring some of that fun into the sporting environment in the future to make things more accessible and inclusive is a good question. But we also know for a lot of clubs, um, you know, that might sound cool to us, but they want to get back to playing the sport they know. And perhaps that wellness piece really is the number one consideration for all of us in just trying to support people through this, especially as we learn more um, about the economic impact of, of COVID-19. Our next speaker is Michael King, uh, the Manager of Business Development at Leisure Networks. Um, Michael has recently put on a few um, webinars for sport clubs. The Big Sport was um, happy to help assist with delivering some content. Um, it's had a lot of insights from an engagement with clubs over the past few weeks. And so Michael's going to bring um, the perspective of Leisure Networks and from Regional Sports Assembly as well. Over to you, Michael. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, thank you, everyone, for um, jumping on today. And it's a hard act to follow after um, Karen and Mel there. Um, I'll try and provide a little bit on top of that that the clubs and, and council and sport might be able to pick up. Um, but if I'm duplicating information, um, I'll get Tom to give me a little tap um, through the screen. So that'll be good. So um, just firstly, um, Leisure Networks. So we're a regional sports assembly based in Geelong, uh, but we also service Metro Melbourne. Um, and a big part of our service is the NDIS, which is disability. And the other side is our, um, our club support um, through networks. So working with sport, working with local government, working with grassroots as well. So um, I quickly just want to acknowledge, um, we know that sport, national and, and state sports, are really hurting at the moment, staff-wise, resource-wise and, and delivery-wise. And I just want to really give a shout out to local government, um, the peak bodies um, and regional sports assemblies to really picking up the, the weight to really support our sports. I know regionally, um, a lot of our, our staff that we work with locally um, are down to you know minimum hours, EFT and all the rest of it. And they've really relied on regional sports to, to step up and support their clubs through a tough time while they really focus on just holding their jobs. So um, really credit to everyone out there that's, that's pulling together. Um, I just want to um, really give a recap. We've recently delivered a number of Metro Melbourne forums to really just provide support as quick as we could. We got these off the ground in a week, um, pulling together some legal support, some financial support and obviously peak body support. Um, these are actually going to be rolled out um, through the RSV network um, over the next few weeks as well. Um, they, were, they were quite a success. So um, I've just got some findings um, from those forums that I'd like to share with local government and sport. But before I do that, um, I just want to quote a colleague of mine that I was chatting with yesterday. Um, we were talking about what has COVID-19 done to the, to the really strong clubs and the, really, you know, the clubs that really are struggling. And we saw, or we almost thought, like a like a really successful business to a business that's really trying to stay afloat. Um, the the gap potentially could widen. Um, strong clubs could get stronger. Other club, weaker clubs could actually find resource wise and and strategy wise could really um, go the other way. So 
Um, just a quote from Fee Bennett. She may be listening or she might be on a horse, um, riding a horse at the moment. But the, the current situation will probably expose, expose clubs who struggle um, and really shine on stronger clubs. We all want to be competitive. This is an opportunity um, to instill some initiatives that will equalise the competition you're in. So um, a really good opportunity for us to come together and really support those clubs that need the help. Um, and obviously the leverage from clubs that are doing really well. So I'll just start off with that. Um, next slide, thanks Tom. Um, just some key themes from the, from the forums and um, we're actually going to, um, we've got a list of um, the clubs, sports um, that actually attended our forums. And we're gonna circulate these to the state bodies and to local government to pretty much say from your local government, you had 35 cl clubs that attended these forums. There was eight from tennis, six from basketball, blah, blah, blah. And I think that gives you a true reflection and a true identification of the engagement within your local government and obviously from the sport as well, for sport to actually look at those numbers and say, okay, these clubs have actually reached out for some help and, and can provide that um, moving forward. So just some key themes, um, managing finance with folks on sponsorship. It's been covered already today, so I won't go into that, but sponsorship, um, when you talk about workshop series, sponsorships haven't really been looked at in the last few years, but it feels like sponsorship may be the number one topic moving forward. Um, how do we retain? How do we look after them? Um, and how do we diversify within that? Uh, member engagement. I've just put in here around, is it a chance to recruit? And it's really harsh, but clubs that are doing things really well and engaging members really, really well, it potentially is an opportunity to recruit recruit members, recruit committee members, recruit presidents, recruit players. Um, and, it's, and it really sounds harsh, but it goes back to my point of there may be a bigger divide between stronger clubs and clubs that have less volunteers, less members, less resources. So we need to really, as a sector, think about how we, how we band together to ensure clubs do not fall and stronger clubs do not get stronger. So it's, hard, it's a hard one to think about, but it's just, I'm just throwing the carrot out for us to really consider moving forward. Um, contracts and legalities, clubs, I, I believe, and, and we had a legal firm talk about this, clubs have full control, or not full control, control of their destiny. So when you're talking about player, member, uh, player contracts, um, your bar contracts, your catering contracts, those sort of things, um, clubs actually have control within the COVID-19, there's a clause because of the pandemic, that you can, you can make changes to contracts. And at the end of the day, we are finding and we've been advised from our legal firms that clubs can make decisions that are in the best interest of this themselves and not the individual, the consumer. Um, membership categories, um, both Karen and, and Mel uh, touched on that. Um, we're focused on playing at the moment. Is there an opportunity? We talk about adding prize with that, adding a jumper, adding um, an online forum, an online membership. At the moment, people are paying for memberships to play. Is it a chance for us as sector to come together and think of, or sport to think of what else can we offer that if moving forward, playing is not an option. What are things that people may want that may not include playing? Um, you know, access to an you know access to an online training um, training package that the club purchases that athletes can get access to. Um, social media, we all know that clubs are doing it really well. We're well and truly seeing them at Legend Networks. We follow a lot of clubs, and we know the clubs that are really really engaging to their clubs well. We talk about volunteering. Some clubs that are doing it well are just echoing volunteers after volunteers and thanking them through social media. It is a chance right now where we have time to have daily posts about different things that you don't normally get to do during a season. Um, and the last thing is in diversifying income. So a lot of clubs that really focus their income on specific phases um, at the moment when it's sponsorship, events and membership are hurting big time. Is there an opportunity for us now as, as, a, as a sport and as a, as, a, as a local government collective to really invest in our clubs to, to look at diversifying incomes into different ways that if moving forward we have pandemics and it impacts membership or in, impacts functions or in, impacts sponsorship, there may still be an income source for the club moving forward. Um, challenges and opportunities. This is, this is my last slide. So um, challenges, continue engaging with, with no clear line in sight. Karen talked about that. When are we playing? All right. Hard to keep engaging people when they, there is no light at the end of the tunnel. So um, not having a membership strategy for un, unforeseen circumstances. We've got a lot of clubs telling us through the forums that they received their membership. They went and paid for all their, their guernseys and all their outfits and all their equipment. 
and now families are asking for money back, they've got no money left. They've got nothing to put back. So what do they do? So um, that's really a chance when we're talking strategic planning, I believe membership categories um, and sponsorship should be two pillars that clubs are looking at moving forward um, about an innovation and how do we um, plan for future potential um, mitigation um, and risk management. Um, coaches, committees, uh, members, how are, they, how are they using their time? What I'm seeing at the moment is committees are still as engaged or as engaged and busy as ever, but I am seeing a lot of coaches particularly are moving into other spaces. I'm going to work more. I'm looking after my kids. I'm using that time in different spaces. I'm not seeing coaches maximising engagement with players um, and we're not hearing that they're having regular Zoom meetings half an hour on a Wednesday night. This is a session plan. I'll see you next Wednesday. I'm not seeing a lot of that um, and I'm not hearing a lot of that from the club forums that we're doing. So, And we do know the number one key um, focus of any club in engagement, that the people that people want to hear from is not the parents, they want to hear from the coach. They want the coach as the person that mentors them and gives them that information. Um, providing consistent support to members. How do you prioritise families that are doing it hard and families that are doing it harder and even harder again? How do we prioritise how that looks as a club? We're volunteers, clubs that they're volunteer people and how are they being able to prioritise what's the most important thing for families at the moment. Um, just some quick opportunities. Um, op, great, op, great time to be writing new strategic plans, which has already been talked about, and potentially maybe not a strategic plan, maybe a short-term 12-month action plan about what can be done here and now. Um, the shutdown has surfaced clear gaps and needs within clubs. Um, what we're hearing and seeing at a, at a national level is we've looked at Rugby League and, and Rugby Australia um, have both lost um, their CEOs, the pandemic has really opened up Pandora's box to the real issues within some sports um, and it's doing it at club land. So let's look at those areas and let's prioritise them. Membership, um, sponsorship, that sort of stuff. Um, chance to rework committee roles and responsibilities. Committees are tired, they're exhausted. Um, what a great opportunity to bring some new innovation, to look at bringing in some, some new membership. We're talking members are, members are tired. What I do find is sometimes a good chance to move out the old wood um, because the new, the new opportunity has, has been waiting for that to happen. How does that look? How does that look? Are two hour meetings needed anymore face to face? How good is technology? Let's start using it. Comfort of your own home. It's winter, it's cold. Let's do it from home. Less travel, more innovation. Supports mums that are looking after kids at home as well at times. Um, highlights, um, club commitment and those that who are loyal. Great opportunity to, to take the finance out of paying for things and actually seeing who's loyal and who's committed to our club. Um, and it's a great opportunity to engage or re-engage with local um, regional sports assemblies that are there, that are funded and that have staff that are there to support you while the sports are um, a less active, um, you know, a less EFT time. So um, they're probably the biggest things for me and that is across both metro and regional, um, regional communities. The difference probably with regional is you've got sports, sports hubs where there's multiple sports based out of the same facility um, that are all feeding from different information from their sport body. Whereas at Metro clubs, bigger clubs, um, potentially just a football club or just a netball club. So they are really focused on their individual sport and what, they, what their needs are at the moment. So um, they're just some insights and I've, I hope that I've helped a little bit. Thanks, Michael. That's an excellent summary um, of all the recent work that Legend Networks have done. And um, you obviously had a great response to those webinars. I know you've got uh, a lot more planned in the pipeline. So keep up the great work. Our, let me get back onto my slides to click through. Our third, sorry, fourth speaker is Sharon Milner, the Senior Preventions Partnership Advisor at the Victorian Responsible Gambling Foundation, um, who run the Love the Game initiative. Um, something Sharon will touch on is we had a meeting last year of different organisations that try to do health promotion work and support with clubs, including like the Good Sports, Vic Health, uh, Valley Sports from Shepherd and Vic Sport, Responsible Gambling Foundation. And um, Sharon made an excellent point that um, even where we simplify these various things that we're trying to help clubs to do, even when we make it easy for them, there are so many things that we keep throwing at them to consider, so many goals we try and work with clubs to achieve. And no matter how much we simplify it, it can still be tough on the volunteers. And it's probably even gonna be harder in this environment. So um, anyway, without further ado, over to you, Sharon. Thanks for that, Tom. Um, it's still a little bit of my thunder there, but um, thanks to you and the Vic Sport team and hi everyone.
before I start, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm on um, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, so as Tom mentioned, I'm from Victorian Responsible Gambling Foundation. Uh, we're a statutory body of the Victorian State Government. Um, and we're all about trying to prevent and reduce harm from gambling. So our key initiative that you see there is the Love the Game program. Um, we've got over 400 clubs on board who all refuse um, to take sports betting revenue. And that includes all 10 AFL clubs in Victoria uh, and several state sporting bodies who uh, I believe are on the line today. Um, and it's been a really interesting time for gambling um, over COVID-19. So uh, look, in many ways, it's almost the perfect storm for harm given some of the biggest drivers around why people gamble um, are financial pressures, um, isolation, loneliness, boredom, escapism. Um, and that's why it's so strongly connected to mental health. Um, and the research will lag, of course, behind what we uh, know is happening in real time. But some of the signals we're seeing so far that I wanted to share. Um, so we've had closure of pokies, venues, casinos, TO, TABs, obviously, um, and very little sport to bet on. So we've seen a bit of a surge in um, the number of online betting accounts that have been opened. Um, horse race betting seems to have increased. Um, we've seen a rise in the amount of novelty betting promotions. So you've probably seen these, but um, betting on the weather, MasterChef, Colour of ScoMo's tie, um, and even COVID fatalities. Um, we've seen social um, betting circles move virtually online, which I think is um, relevant for a lot of sporting clubs where they seem to connect. Um, and also we're watching the online casino space closely as um, uh, we are with eSports, which I'm sure a lot of you guys are, um, and seeing you know, increases in that space around the virtual sport offerings um, such as NBA 2K um, and Formula One. Um, but for the next couple of minutes, I just wanted to very briefly talk about what Tom mentioned there, and I refer to that as the health sports sector. So um, the organisations or programs that are trying to use sport as a setting or a vehicle for health and social change. Um, and there's no denying that that's arrived, um, as Tom mentioned. Um, you guys would know you're being hit with um, offer after offer to participate in these things and as are the clubs. Um, and most of these are prevention programs. So. Um, we're usually trying to stop an issue before it happens or reduce the risk or minimise the harm. Um, and it's a really hard sell for clubs. Um, and I think what we're seeing play out at the moment um, is a really beautiful example of prevention in action. So um, what I've noticed recently is a bit of narrative that, um, you know, we feel like we're being punished by lockdown. Um, and I'm not saying that's not a valid view, but when I hear that fact with things like the hospitals are empty, um, it does rattle my kind of health promotion nerd brain because I just think what kind of upside down reality are we in where we think empty hospitals are a cause of complaint? Um, but I get it, empty means invisible and that's what prevention in action looks like. And that's why um, you know, our initiatives can be a hard sell. Uh, and I acknowledge that we do tend to, I guess, want to act when we can see or experience harm from an issue. Um, so Tom, I might just grab, get you to pop the next slide up. Um, and look, I'm not gonna labor on these things because they're things everyone out there knows already, but it is so critical um, for our sector to really make sure these are our truths we live by. Um, we call it effective context. So essentially, if what we're offering isn't meeting or bumping into something in that column with a tick in it, um, we're unlikely to get buy-in from clubs. And on the flip, if it threatens something on the right-hand side with a cross, um, we can almost forget about it. Um, and without wanting to insult um, health sports sector colleagues on the line, I'll own this saying it's my view, but I think we do overpromise a little bit. Um, so a lot of our brochures will say the benefits are enhance your club's reputation, increase your membership, um, you'll get more support, more sponsors. And so, you know, poor old mate goes and does our program. Um, patiently waits and, and none of these things happen. Um, but what I have consistently noticed um, where clubs do seem to shift and they shift really well and I think it's relevant um, for the time we're in, um, it seems to be around four key triggers. Um, so the first one is, you know, there could be a trauma. So someone at the club has a personal connection to an issue um, or there might be, you know, a tragic incident around death or illness of a member that really harnesses a club. Um, there's crisis, so you know a club um, desperately needs new members, and then they decide to diversify where they would usually recruit from, attract you know new arrivals from the community, and realise you know the beautiful benefits of cultural diversity. Um, the third one is sometimes there's a health champion that emerges, so some a new gun home member decides to take over the canteen, for example, um, or it's enforced. So you know a club might 
be fined for breaching its liquor license or a state body or council um, tells their clubs if you don't field X number of female teams, um, there'll be a sanction. Um, and from these shifts, we see really amazing outcomes. Um, and they're the kind of outcomes that a lot of our programs are looking for. Um, but unfortunately, they, they don't actually have a lot um, directly correlated with how we design them. Um, so tell me, if I'll get you to go to just the last slide to pull this all together. Um, when you consider those four triggers, they're generally quite organic or unplanned events. And I think it tells us, and what's really relevant for what we're in at the moment, is that I find clubs are highly adaptive and highly effective when they're forced into a space of response. Um, so I guess just to wrap up on some of that sector work that um, Tom mentioned. Um, so Matt Cameron at Vic Health and I co-hosted that session and there, there was about nine or 10 organisations in the room, um, all who were very well aware of that previous slide and the challenges and we're all saying, oh, we stripped our programs right back, like, you know, the three or four things we're only asking clubs to do. Um, but then we looked around and, and look at the hands up who were saying that and that's nearly 30 or 40 actions that we're asking of a club and generally, one person at that club is taking all that on. So I think as a sector, we're starting to try and find that alignment and come together and, and understand that we're generally addressing a lot of the same underlying factors. So sometimes it's risk taking, normalized behaviors that are you know, sometimes underpinned by various things like gendered stereotypes, attitudes, stigma. Um, but in the prevention space, I think um, we can burrow right down to a, quite a simple premise that I think everyone on this line can contribute to. Um, that does help our outcomes and that's getting people to participate in sport and giving them that positive experience. Um, so they obviously stay and continue to develop and evolve those life skills. Um, you know, we know them teamwork, resilience, respect, goal setting, friendship, structure, decision making that all actually help protect against a lot of these harms. So I think for me um, going forward, it's, it's really our challenge is to let go um, of ego as a sector, like we talk about a lot. Do we want people to remember love the game, not the odds tagline or um, gambling harm to reduce? And, you know, philosophically, that's a pretty easy one to answer. But the reality is that sometimes we feel that we need to show a thing um, and it's very seductive to do so. So I think at the end of the day, as a health sports sector um, and as a broader sector, we're sharing the same challenge, um, but we're not sharing the solution. So I really think that this time and coming out of this time will force us to a much more coordinated response that um, I think really helps um, clubs and communities therefore thrive. So um, I'll leave it there, but um, thanks again for the opportunity to share that, Tom. Excellent, thanks Sharon. Uh, I think that little table is, is really, really useful uh, for anyone that's planning to approach clubs to um, get them to work on really anything. So yeah, thanks for sharing your excellent insights. and. Obviously look forward to continuing to work with you and, and the group in the uh, Sport Promotion Health Sector Network or whatever we had <laughs> titled it. Um, great, so thank you again for everyone's excellent insights. That was, that was fantastic. Um, I've definitely learned a lot myself and got a lot of new things to, to think about. Um, we're gonna throw it open to Q&A now. Um, so, what people can do is use the Q&A function in Zoom to throw in some questions. We've got five at the moment, so feel free to throw a few more in and see what you can get to in the next um, 25 minutes. Um, there was one question around how do we find out who uh, the local regional sports assembly is from Kylie. So you can Google regional sport Victoria, which is the peak body, um, and find out, have a look at that website. Um, if anyone's on the chat from an RSA, um, they might be able to post the link to that website or if you, Kylie, can post in the chat uh, where you live, then we can try and work out the exact um, regional sports assembly for you. Um, I might go back to the very first question, which is this coming back to, um, I guess, anxiety at clubs. Um, and this is really for anyone can have a go at answering this um, from the panel. Um, what might be some of the ways that we can support clubs um, to manage anxiety around um, COVID-19 and, and returning to play? Uh, I might jump in. Uh, hi, Andy. Um, obviously, we've met before being down at Peninsula Health. I guess it, it is quite common 
uh, that we're facing I get, across all local government. And it really is the conversations. It's really understanding that, um, giving some, some resource and advice, but not creating too much expectation. Again, it's going back, you know, I know, um, Andy, you particularly work with a lot of your clubs in, in the morning to Peninsula region, but it is looking at what the sports are doing themselves and what resources are out there. But it's, it's really about the conversations and understanding uh, and creating a bit of a plan and a bit of a pathway of, of what is looking like it's going to happen with obviously being flexible and agile. So for me and, and from my perspective, it's definitely the conversation settings um, and, and the reassurance that there is support mechanisms out there through uh, different health avenues, different sport avenues as well. Excellent. Thanks for that, Mel. Um, we've got a question here for Karen from Nat Nolan. Um, Karen, can you think of any examples of clubs um, combining, I guess, sort of activations around engaging people socially along with those traditional sport offerings to attract more diverse population groups? Um, example of clubs that are doing it or just... Um, so we've got a number of associations that are set in regional Victoria and metropolitan clubs are predominantly standalone. So um, I think the, the absolute thing that we need to think about now is that social activation and where's, um, how do we actually engage hubs along the way? So hubs of, you know, whether it, it doesn't have to be competition, but good fun kick arounds on a on a football pitch or you know what whatever environment your sport belongs to to actually start to reactivate engagement particularly when we've got you know kids out there that are also a little bit disengaged from school because of the homeschooling that's you know putting other other pressures on families and things like that they're going to be busting to get out there we know social restrictions are going to stop it so how do we actually look at that and, and engage those other community groups that we haven't engaged before. So when I spoke before about us starting to prepare a Football Victoria resource library, part of that is inclusion training that we will take out to clubs to ensure that they are um, assisted uh, in um, bringing in communities that um, they may not necessarily have. So that will help grow the grow football out there. Can I answer that question? I think I did. <laughs> Sorry. I think so. No, it was good. And can I throw another one your way? Um, any, I guess, ideas or suggestions around increasing participation by women and girls? Like, how might clubs really jump on that opportunity coming out of COVID-19? Yeah, so my, I'm um, sorry, the dogs are about to bark. So that's, <laughs> that's, be, that's the benefit of working from home. Sorry. Um, yeah, so my, my whole women and girls strategy is got a whole base around um, social activation. So I, I see football as very um, competitive focus. And yes, obviously a lot of clubs do engage and there is social activation. But my women and girls strategy is all based around a hashtag football her way, which is enabling a woman or a girl to actually participate in football whichever way she wants. So she doesn't have to be an elite referee unless she wants to be. She can be the little girl that likes to just have a kick around with her friends. She might be the soccer mum that likes to get down there with a bunch of other mums and just laugh at the way they are engaging in football and enjoying that activation. It's bringing in other community groups as well. It's just supporting um, any way that that woman or girl wants to um, engage in football. So, um, yeah, I think the social space is the, is the biggest space of all, um, particularly for football and how do we activate that. Excellent. Thanks, Karen. Um, got a question here that we might be able to throw Michael's way. Um, any ideas on strategies to engage teenagers? Um, and I guess, you know, how we can motivate them to train at home? Yeah, <laughs> it's, a, um, it's a really good question. And we know that teenagers pretty much are the, are the drop off age um, in a lot of sports. So we're talking about an age group that um, potentially exits sport and we're trying to engage them during this time. Um, 
what I've found has worked really well um, with my position within a local club and what I've seen is the use of um, you know online videos and development of online videos. So rather than um, a coach or you know a sport putting out do this session, run this session, here's an hour here, this is how you do it in social isolation at home one-on-one. I've seen some innovation from clubs where they've actually spoken to the group you're talking about and said, what is a way that you can stay engaged and how can you do that? And a lot of the time, it's actually putting it back on the kids to actually develop the schedule, develop the the function of what they want to achieve and actually putting it to them. For example, um, you know, a captain, captain of a sporting club or whatever, um, this week, I want I want the group to really focus on some touch or some um, some agility sort of work. Can you put together a quick one minute video, which we're actually going to um, circulate amongst the group um, to actually create that engagement, and then you're going to call on someone else in the group to actually lead that next time. So you're putting the ownership back on the youth group rather than as a parent or as a coach saying, "Hey guys, this is the session plan. I want you to go ahead and do it." put it back on the group and, and actually get them to develop their own content. Cause the reality is right now people are c- keeping fit and healthy, but at the same time, how many kids are at the backyard doing a training session for an hour that they've read online? Like it's just, it's just not happening to get any advantage. We're all in the same position. We're all going to be delayed. We're all going to have four weeks to train together before we get back to sport. So I'm thinking more, less around the actual skill acquisition and more around the engagement. How are we keeping these guys engaged? So when the curtain's raised and we can play again, 35 kids that left all come back at the same time. That's what I'd be looking at. Um, does anyone else in the panel want to add to that one? No, all good if not. Touching on that actually, uh, there's a question from Adam around um, that window that we potentially enter of Allowed, being allowed to have smaller gatherings of potentially less than 10 and not going back to full sport yet. Um, what suggestions might anyone have on, you know, what clubs can do specifically in that time to try and engage people and just get them back um, participating at a club? I think it's got to remain the, um, the support that we've, we've sort of a little bit um, spoken about is yes, does does 10 people help equate to a certain number of, of kids, for example, in a team? And if so, are they, if it's 10, are they able to get down to another facility and actually have a kick around and re-engage that way? It is going to be extremely difficult. It's not the sport that we're, we knew the other day. You know, it, it has changed. And um, we, as we've said, we also need to think of new ways to actually get that up and going and connect and re-engage and sustain and um, get our, our members back. So I think it it's just smart thinking, you know, if there's a whole lot of empty spaces out there, so how, how do we get a group of kids down there? Can a coach go and take 10 down? Hmm. Parents can move themselves around the perimeter of the, the football ground or the basketball court or whatever it is. So, um, is that the way that we can do it in the interim until restrictions begin to start to lift? Thanks, Karen. Um, Questions just come through around managing the winter summer sport changeover. Um, I know that the CEOs of those state sport associations are discussing. So in some respects, um, you know, depend on the outcome of those discussions, but Maybe Mel, I mean, what are your thoughts from a council on um, how sport needs to communicate and manage any potential issues around that transition? Yeah, great question. I think the question on a lot of local government's lips at the moment, it's one that keeps coming up weekly. Uh, At the moment as well, Sport and Rec Victoria have a a local government group uh, made up of regional um, interface and metro councils that are discussing exactly that. So they did actually go out and survey um, all local governments around the challenges, the impacts. Um, We all know that local governments uh, manage their facilities a little bit differently. So with your wickets and your um, your turf wickets, your synthetic wickets, your cover over, um, plus, you know, joint use facilities for summer and winter. 
So there's no easy answer, but the questions are going back to, as you said, Tom, the, the sports themselves, and then coming right down to the local level leagues. And that's, that's where we need that guidance from the overarching sport bodies um, to provide that information to the leagues and continue to have that open communication because there will be some challenges, but that's all being fed back up to Sport and Rec Victoria um, to hopefully also liaise with the state bodies and councils as a whole. So um, lots of information transfer. So there will be challenges, but it's something that we need to all be mindful of. And as Karen said, sport probably won't return as is and what that modified sport looks like, whether it's season changes and, and how that, that might impact um, if we move a, a winter season slightly and the impact that when we start summer season, you know, and some of the summer sports being washed out. So lots of considerations. So um, there's no easy solution in that one either, but communication and collaboration being the key. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, a couple of questions coming through around the AIS um, resume to play document. Just letting people know to put those in. I'm not going to try and answer those at this point in time because we probably don't have the right answers for you, but that's something that um, we're definitely looking at and, and can potentially be part of future updates or webinars from Big Sport. Um, Sharon, I might put a question to you. Um, how do you think, I guess, the way your organisation works with clubs or the other organisations in our network, um, how might that potentially change or be adapted over the next 12 months? Um, it's a good question. I think uh, I can answer um, from our organisation what we feel um, is something that does work well and it, it builds on um, I think something Michael was saying about who owns the message so the kids you know aren't necessarily picking up something online and doing it but if it's someone they know and trust giving them that message they'll go and do it. Um, so for us we partner with a probably close to 30 different sport partners um, who are the voice and face of our message. I think that's a good starting point for a lot of our programs because then um, we are seen a bit closer um, to being part of um, the offering as opposed to a bolt on or something that sits aside. Um, but, you know, as I was saying at the end there, I think a lot of it really comes back to, uh, and I believe it was on one of your um, opening slides, Tom, about social cohesion. And that's, I think, the cry that a lot of us have been um, hearing around um, missing sport you know people are missing that connection and that sense of purpose and belonging and I think the more that we can step away from uh, necessarily having to be overtly talking about our issue and understand that the more people um, are in a space where that is achieved um, the better off we are in pre preventing our issues and getting the outcome that we want so I think for us it'll be um, possibly sitting together more and like I said trying to present something that we all know is um, a key to unlocking um, some really good outcomes for the issue we're addressing um, and that's going to have to come through more simplified ways of presenting um, you know what we want the club to hopefully do as part of it and then I think it's also surrendering like I said I called it ego call it what you want um, that we might necessarily not necessarily be the voice that delivers that message into the club. Excellent thanks for that Sharon. Um, I do want to start wrapping up fairly soon. Um, what I might actually do, and this is going to put the uh, presenters on the spot, which we always love doing, um, but if anyone's a fan of the ABC Insiders program, or maybe you watched the last five minutes before the Offsiders comes on to talk about sport, um, everyone just giving their sort of final insight or tip. So um, give everyone a quick two seconds to quickly think, what are they going to say? But we might just do a quick little sort of final recommendation um, from each panellist. And then we'll uh, look towards wrapping this one up. Um, Karen, would you like to start? Any final words of advice or wisdom? Oh, advice and wisdom, yeah. Put us on the spot, Tom. Good on you, matey. Uh, <laughs> no, um, I just want to say the great thing about sport, um, and it's been going on for a number of years now, but being in the game a long, long time, it never used to. And that's that sport is very willing to help each other. So. I'm quite happy to always be out there and not just be helping our football clubs, but, you know, if anybody would, would like to have a chat or anything like that, um, I'm more than happy to be available to that, for that. Um, we, as, as, I, as we've mentioned, it, it's totally different 
Um, no one wrote this book on COVID-19, no one. So it was a whole new fluid environment that we've heard for so long of things that we just had to be actually quite reactive to in the very beginning. And I remember looking back um, just those six weeks ago or eight weeks ago when this all hit, whenever that was, that you know we were meeting daily. In fact, the executive team was sitting in the boardroom um, together because things were coming at us at a rate of knots. So it's, we are starting to see that there is change. I did remember a couple of weeks ago going, how will sport look? What, what is the role that all of us that are here today, what role do we play in sport moving forward? But how that actually comes out is, is how we choose for that to be. So I think that is um, sort of winding that back is how do we all work together to make sure we know the health and wellbeing outcomes. We, we know that research has told us that now for a number of years. We used to guess that, that sport was good for you because you had a run around and, and you felt good after it. But we actually know these days that it is. So how do we collectively make sure that sport doesn't go down that gurgler and that we all work really hard to re-engage and get um, kids and families back? Because for those um, particularly that are hurting really badly out there, they need that connectivity. They need a place to go, a place that they can belong a place that they can form friendships and um, and be there for the long term. So there's a lot of work to do. It's um, I've never been busier, <laughs> and life at football is extremely busy. But it is it, it is crazy, and I actually find it extremely exciting that um, we have a there is a new world emerging, and um, I do call it the new side. So um, yeah, I think if we look forward and look towards that um, light at the end of that tunnel will all come out okay. Thanks, Karen. That's an excellent message. Um, Mel? Uh, is it easy to say what Karen said? Um, <laughs> but I guess reiterating that as well is, uh, it is about learning from each other, continually using each other's resources, um, leveraging off people we know throughout the sector and the industry to gain information, to support. But from, from a local government perspective, it's, yes, it's using that buzzword, it's being agile, it's being flexible, it's being able to um, look at how we do things differently, how, you know, sitting on some of the things we've always wanted to do, but been a little bit risk averse, um, using this time to actually implement some of those ideas and strategies. But the first and foremost is community wellbeing and where our community sits in this space and just acknowledging that um, what might work on in one local government may not work in the other local governments, depending on your cohorts, your your challenges. So being really mindful that everything won't look the same and cookie cutter across all different areas, but how we can be flexible in those spaces. But yeah, I'm a little bit like Karen, I'm getting the best learning from having Yes, I'm busy, I'm busier than normal, but having the opportunity to read, learn from others, listen to different perspectives and, and really triggering those things that uh, are important and how we, um, sometimes it's not always gonna work and that's okay as well. It's being able to step out of that space and, and try something as well. But yeah, first and foremost, collaboration, communication and community. So a couple of three C's. Awesome. Thanks, Mel. Michael. Yeah, echo that. But um, I guess for, from our perspective, um, we all stopped. Like when, when, this, when this hit, we stopped. We, we were shocked um, and we didn't know what was next. And I think now we've all gathered our thoughts. We've had our recharge. Um, and I think whilst the, the future is unclear, I think it's an opportunity for sport, local government, associations and clubs to really start putting those things on the back burner, putting them in place. So putting the development time in the things we didn't get a chance to. And so when things clear up, it's an opportunity. Why not take a risk? When things open up, why not take a risk and try that new thing? And I guess the biggest thing that I've picked up along the way is the, the organisations that over-communicate are the ones that are going to get out of this in a really good space. The ones that are under-communicating are the ones that Chinese Whispers has started and people can create their own story when Chinese Whispers starts. So let's over-communicate and ensure that the people that need to hear know what they know and, and, and just share that story right across the, right across the state. 
Thanks, Michael and Sharon. Um, yeah, look, I think for us, we're a little bit different because we're basically relying on the sports sector um, for a lot of our um, outcomes. So for me, it would be, you know, because I guess we've all stopped, it would, um, I guess, be a, a bit of a plea for um, if, if you are seeing things around disparate offerings um, that we could do better as a health sports sector to come together and better serve clubs or, or the sports sector, please reach out. Um, because we're we're in the same space and really open to that. And I think um, probably one element, um, you know, that's well realised around healthy clubs and healthy communities is how we start to demonstrate that kind of social return on investment because, um, you know, addressing some of these issues that we're trying to do through sport returns um, genuine economic benefit back to communities. So I think if we can work together as well in in assisting through our resources um, for you to demonstrate that, then then that would be a really good outcome as well. Great, and if I could definitely echo all of those comments and just add that um, I just think what people should definitely do at some point as we start getting back to not so much normal, but potentially going back to the office and doing things the way we used to, take the time to write down the things that you've done or, or new things or new ways you've approached work, write that down and think about how you can keep it. Um, there's definitely a lot of things I've done that I, I think you know we need to keep doing that certain process or type of communication moving forward. So we can learn a lot from all this. Thank you again to all of our panellists. I'll give a little sort of clap from my end and I'm sure everyone will be clapping at home and appreciate all of your insights and input. So thanks again very much for being part of the webinar today. Finally, just letting everyone know that um, our third and final series, uh, sorry, webinar of this series is next Tuesday, the 12th of May. Um, that's gonna have three speakers from local governments and looking at um, participation and um, inclusion in issue, initiatives that local governments lead. So um, if you're interested in learning more about that, make sure you jump on again next week. I also did notice that Play By The Rules are hosting a short webinar this Friday with Paul Kennedy and Bridie O'Donnell. So that will be worth jumping on. You can um, head to the Play By The Rules website to look at that. Um, but apart from that, it is a nice sunny blue sky day today. So I'll let everyone go and enjoy the sunshine and thanks very much for taking part in this morning's webinar.